Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Shadowproof event. I'm hosting a book discussion right now. I'm your host, Kevin Gastola, and I am joined this evening by Raymond Bonner, who is the author of Weakness and Deceit, America and El Salvador's Dirty War. So, welcome. Thank you. And this book was released, uh, it was a book based on your reporting for, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were working for the New York Times, is that correct? I was. Um, yeah. I, I, actually, I had, uh, somewhat interestingly, I had um, I'd been a lawyer, and then I dropped out, as it were, and I went down to Latin America, and I ended up in El Salvador on Sunday, and the American nuns were killed on Tuesday, and as they say, the rest is history. Now, I realize that for you and your generation, that's ancient history, but... At the time, it was uh, compelling at-the-moment history. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is still compelling to people today. And so you uh, had this book re-released. It's uh, published again by OR Books. And they and for it, you wrote uh, a new prologue, um, adding some context uh, for people who are reading it today. So I, I guess... How do you see this history currently in 2016? Some of your thoughts as you're, as you're considering what happened decades ago. I was actually quite surprised, Kevin, um, when, I, when I decided to do, for various reasons, that I ended up doing an update of the book. I mean, I never imagined that I would revisit this 30, you know, 30 years later. Um, but I was surprised and troubled I guess, by the parallels <clears throat> to the current situation. I mean, it is hard. I don't want to make light of it, but it is hard for younger people, anybody pra probably under 40 or 50, to, to realize that in 1980, El Salvador in Central, and this little country, you know, you can see it from a helicopter, as Bob White used to say. This little country in Central America was at the center of American foreign policy in the way that Iraq, Iran, and Syria, and ISIS are today. I mean, that is going to be incomprehensible to many, many people who almost didn't live through that. And as I looked at it, again, again, for various reasons that I came back to it, I saw incredible and troubling parallels. You know, the title of the book is Weakness and Deceit. And the deceit, as we all know now, and we were led into the war in Iraq totally misled and deceitful statements out of Washington. But it's exactly what got us into the situation in El Salvador. It was the deceit in Washington. At that time, the Reagan administration could never have maintained support for the American intervention in El Salvador if they had been honest with the American people in the same way we would never have gone to war in Iraq if the government had been honest. Now, uh, so let's let's go back uh, to uh, as you're trying to find a good entry point into uh, the issue of El Salvador. So maybe a good basic question, just to begin diving in, is is when did El Salvador become a focal point of U.S. foreign policy. At what point did it become this issue where, you know, you as a journalist were in a position where you thought, "I need to deploy. I need to. I need to travel. I need to head to El Salvador and cover what's going on." What happened was this was the height of the Cold War. It was before the wall came down. We were still engaged in the Cold War against communism, and this was considered the bulwark against communism. Nicaragua, the a dictatorship, the Somoza family kleptocracy dictatorship that America had supported for generations, decades, had fallen to a, the left-wing Sandinistas. And now there was a, a civil war in El Salvador, a revolution. As the American ambassador used to say, Robert White, mocking the policy, which he didn't agree with. In Washington, there was a concern that Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, all the way up to the soft underbelly of Kansas. I mean, there was 
And when Reagan came in, he said, this is where we're going to draw the line. This is where we're going to send a message to Moscow. Again, I go back to, you know, it's hard to believe in 2016 that in 1980, this was the front burner, the forefront of American foreign policy, is every bit as much as the Middle East is today. And the feeling was, in Washington, we have to stop the expansion of communism, and this is where we're going to draw the line. Let's dig into some of what was going on in this country. So, uh, in the nineteen in the nineteen seventies, we can go, we can go back earlier later, but for right now, uh, let's dig into the issue of the Salvadoran army and uh, a lot of what you put together in one of your chapters talks about how this army was above the law, um, what it was doing and, and getting away with, and the ways in which the United States was either trying to manage the issue or not doing anything about the army or working with them even to handle the opposition. So go ahead and get into the issue of the army. Well, the army was a, was a, a wing of the oligarchy. The oligarchy had run El Salvador for years and years and years and years and years, and the army did their bidding. I mean, it's amazing. When I did the update of the book, when I, when I, I found a cable that the ambassador Robert White had written in 19, early 1980. I mean, it was, ex I didn't have it when I wrote the book. I wished I had. I wished I'd have had it when I was reporting from El Salvador. In 27 pages, Robert White laid out what was happening in El Salvador and absolutely had it spot on. And the cable was classified, top secret. You know why? Because if the American people had ever read that cable, if Congress had ever read that cable, they would have never tolerated the policy. It laid out what was going on. It said, for one thing, Cuba wasn't responsible for what was happening. A revolution was inevitable in El Salvador because the rich had controlled it, democracy had not been allowed, and the military did the bidding of, of, of the rich. And it was it was that simple. It was it was the military, and the United States supported the military, because the old saying goes, as you know, about Nicaragua, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, and that was the attitude there. You've got to stop communism. And as far as understanding the opposition goes, you you do dig into the fact that you know these these labels were basically just slung around. You know, they were saying things like, these are Marxists, Leninists, these are Marxists, these are terrorists, these are communists, uh, and there's really no effort to understand what's creating this. But you do uh, talk about your reporting, you, you, you go back and, and, and describe uh, what you saw um, going out with some of the, the guerrilla forces. And, and so for people who would like to know why people were revolting against this oligarchy. I mean, dig into some of the things that were going on there. It was simple in many ways. Yes, they were Marxists. Yes, there was some Marxist ideology. But the peasants, they had nothing to lose. <clears throat> they had been suppressed, or the labor leaders, but primarily in El Salvador it was the peasants. They were, they were you know, slaves, basically, to the, to, the, uh, to the rich, and they were paid... You know, they were, they were like tenant farmers at best. And so what did they have to lose? So along comes this ideology, the Marxism, and, and says, you know, throw off your shackles, if you will, revolt, you know, proletariat of the world unite. And it was appealing because they had been suppressed so long by the rich. I mean, the rich in El Salvador, not unlike in the United States 100 years ago, made their money off the backs of the poor and the peasants. and um, so along came these, you know, and there were Marxist elements, but there were also Democrats, small d Democrats among the opposition. But then, of course, the military killed them so that there could be no political settlement. You know, I went out. I spent a lot of time in the countryside with the, with the peasants. And, uh, you know, these were not 
And these were peasants, you know, barely eking out a living. And um, along came this ideology that promised them something else, and the church too. I mean, the church was not communist, but at that time there was something called, which was very fascinating. It was liberation theology. And I must say that I, I probably learned more about religion and in reporting from El Salvador than I did growing up, even though I grew up in a quite uh, religious family. But, and I had a, a, I acquired a new appreciation or an appreciation for the Catholic Church and particularly the Jesuits. Um, and it was liberation theology, which basically said, you know, this is not God's will. You are in this situation because of what man has done, and you can change it. And um, it was quite powerful. You uh, described very vividly, uh, and it seems like it was uh, a critical moment that you, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but you, you witnessed the uncovering of this mass grave mm -hmm. where the nuns were, these, these four nuns, um, and, it, and you, you spend a lot of pages actually digging into what happened to these nuns. So if, if you don't mind, could you briefly recount what happened, and then the way in which the United States seemed to, uh, well, didn't seem to, they, they looked away. They didn't do anything to come down on the people involved in uh, these nuns that were, they were murdered. Worse, they didn't do anything. They tried to uh, cover it up and defend it. Um, but even before the nuns were killed, I mean, you say talk briefly, you're going to have to cut me off because it's hard to talk briefly about this. It was such a seminal event in El Salvador. But, you know, and this is a bit of a comment on me, which I'm not sure I like going out over the years a lot, but when the nuns were killed, I, as I say, I got to El Salvador on Sunday, the nuns were killed on Tuesday, and the rest is history. My reaction was, they've just killed four American churchwomen. They've killed 10,000 people this year. 10,000 people, innocent peasants, laborers, workers. But, of course, when they killed four American nuns, everything changed. Um, it was a turning point, and it happened, it happened one week after five political leaders of the left, political leaders, not guerrilla leaders, had been murdered, massacred. They'd broken, the army had broken in, and it was a, it was a moment where El Salvador was going to change. And these four nuns, the three nuns, an American churchwoman, were killed, murdered, raped. Um, Bob White, who was the ambassador, knew immediately that the military was involved. But Bob White had been sent down there by Jimmy Carter, the President Carter, and and Ambassador White believed greatly in Carter. As you know, Carter had a human rights plank to his foreign policy, which the uh, conservatives and the Reagan administration and others uh, chided and and mocked and thought was ridiculous and wanted to change it, and when the nuns were killed, not long after, I mean, they were killed, it was clear immediately that they were killed by the military. Robert White, the ambassador, went there, interviewed a couple of people, and, and they told him it was the military. This was where they were killed was a popular dumping ground for the military death squads. The death squads were everywhere in El Salvador at that time. They were made up of military people in civilian clothes. And this was a dumping ground. I used to go to these dumping grounds. Not that you know, you, you you can go out in the morning as a part of a journalist, as a reporter. You'd go. I mean, it's horrible, but you'd go out in the morning and you'd go to some of these places like El Playon and other. You'd find bodies. I mean, I'm sitting here right now, <clears throat> looking in my office at a photo taken by the great Susan Micellis of two people lying on a rock wall with their hands tied behind their back with wire and string, a woman and a guy, and they've been shot in the head. That happened all the time. You knew immediately, that um, the ambassador knew immediately, and yet, 10 days or two weeks after the nuns were killed, Jean Kirkpatrick, who had been Reagan's foreign policy advisor during the campaign, and who had became his ambassador to the UN, said, well, you know, 
these weren't just nuns, you know. They were political activists on behalf of the left. I mean, she not only exonerated, the, and then she, she was asked, do you think the military was involved, the government was involved? Unequivocally, no. She not only exonerated the military, but she then besmirched these women by saying they were leftists. And then later, Secretary of State Haig, Alexander Haig, said, well, maybe they ran a roadblock. Ran a roadblock? And then he tried to make light of it. He said, well, I've never met any pistol-packing pistol packing, uh, nuns in my day. So they went further than just... They, they, they tried to cover up. And Ambassador White, one of the amazing things, and I hadn't discovered this until recently, until I did this epilogue and, and reissued the book, <clears throat> they tried to get Ambassador White to cover it up, and he refused. He said, I, and there's a cable, I will not be part of any cover-up. And he lost his job. So, I mean, it was a turning point. It was the most, there have been subsequent documents come out of the State Department that said this horrendous crime, this barbaric act, was the turning point in American attitudes, not in the policy, but in the attitudes of the American people towards the policy in El Salvador. So just to make sure that I cover the stuff that I think really should be in this interview, you published the book in 84, and now you do an update. What's, what, what sorts of other material are you finding? Because certainly throughout the book, you, you, you recap your efforts to use the Freedom of Information Act to get records. You recap struggles with classification, with redactions, and so in 2014, 2015, what do you have available now that really brings the story out to an even greater detail? Hell Outside of, of the I thing you just a hell of a lot that I wish that I had when I'd been reporting from El Salvador when I wrote the book, I can tell you that. In, in 1992 or 93, the Clinton administration declassified something like 12,000 documents. And what they revealed, I mean, this is all in the, in the epilogue, in, in a brief summary. It's just staggering. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, the assassination of Roberto Daubisan. I mean, the assassination of Archbishop Romero. Uh, beloved Archbishop Romero, who now has been, you know, is probably going to be made a sainthood. He's been declared a martyr by Pope Francis. Archbishop Romero was assassinated while saying Mass, and he was a voice for the poor and the oppressed and for social justice. Everybody had always suspected that R Roberto Dabisan, uh, excuse me, a charismatic right-wing leader in El Salvador at the time, was responsible. Well, the cables turn out to show it, that an American diplomat, and this was the most astonishing thing I, as a journalist and elsewhere, uh, you know, other ways, uncovered in doing this. There was an American diplomat, Carl Gettinger, 26 years old, with an amazing moral conscience. And he befriended, this is an incredible story, a lieutenant in the Salvadoran National Guard, which was the most brutal of the military forces. And this guy confessed to Gettinger. This guy had blood on his hands, this Salvador lieutenant. In fact, Gettinger took to calling him the killer. But like a good diplomat, Gettinger listened to everybody. And he, can, he told Gettinger how Dalbisan had ordered and, and plotted the killing of Archbishop Romero. And yet in Washington, and this cables came into Washington, Washington kept saying, oh, no. Dabisan's not an extremist. He was responsible, and the CIA concluded it. He was responsible for the murder of Archbishop Romero, plus a lot of other people. And then, and then the most next thing is the killing of the nuns. As I explained earlier, the Reagan administration wanted to cover up that the military was involved. Ambassador Robert White lost his job a career diplomat, a distinguished career diplomat who died sadly in 2000, early last year, 
lost his job because he refused to participate in any cover-up. Kyle Gettner, at considerable, it's the best story of all, at considerable, it's going to be a movie, I hope, at considerable risk to his life and to his career, kept pursuing an investigation into who had murdered the American churchwomen and using this same lieutenant as a source found out the name of the, the, the National Guardsman who had, who had carried out and perpetrated the killing. All that came out in the documents. It was all known back in 1983, but nobody ever told us. It was always covered up. And then you had, you know, the famous El Masote massacre. Famous, I say, because it was on a personal level, quote unquote famous, but it was the biggest massacre in Latin American history. Now think of that, Kevin. The biggest massacre in Latin American history. Over 750 men, women, and children were killed by the Salvadoran military, by a unit that was trained by the United States military. And I reported on that, along with Alma Guillermo Prieto, a fantastic reporter from the Washington Post, both of us went into guerrilla-held territory, along with Susan Micellis, the photojournalist I mentioned earlier. And we saw it, and we wrote it, and there were front-page stories in the Washington Post and the New York Times. And we were pilloried by the Reagan administration and the conservatives. We, I was a reporter out on a limb. It was guerrilla propaganda. It never happened, etc., etc., etc. Now the documents have all been declassified. And it's absolutely clear there was a massacre, and it was carried out by the Salvadoran military. So there's so much that has come out. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. And as I say, we, we, yeah, and this is the problem. I mean, you ask me, how is this relevant today? It's the deceit and, and, and the fact that <clears throat> I don't think we would have gone into Iraq if the quote-unquote truth had been known, if all what we know now had been known then, if we'd known about curveball, if we'd known about, you know, the dissembling, if we'd known what we know now. And the same, it, it's a repeat of what happened in El Salvador. Again, you know, this is hard for many in your audience to remember, but at that time, this was a huge foreign policy issue. And a lot of Americans were opposed to it, and a lot in Congress. But the, 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 the truth was hidden. They couldn't carry out the policy, as I said earlier, <clears throat> without lying to the American people, withholding information from the American people, just like we wouldn't have gone into Iraq if the American people had known. I, I definitely know that you're correct to make that point because the layers of secrecy today are vast and are, are numerous and, and have, in, in recent history, under this current administration received a lot of attention and uh, I don't know if you've got anything to add about the difference between the Reagan administration and now when it comes to trying to fish out information for for articles um, to go into uh, something substantial like what is the role of the United States in El Salvador what do we know about atrocities uh, but I also I did want to steer our um, our conversation towards you were in El Salvador when Ronald Reagan was elected, uh, and I wondered if you could just uh, talk about uh, this moment, what it was like for people there, um, the opposition, or I mean I know the thing I remember you noting is that there were people firing off weapons in excitement that Reagan was now going to be the president of the United States. And I presume these were right-wing death squad people. Well, the, the oligarchs, the rich. I mean, as, as Ambassador White, I mean, Ambassador White should be given sainthood as well. I mean, he was one terrific diplomat, straight. He wasn't any lefty. He, he, knew, he knew the risks of the left. But he's, he, obviously, the American ambassador lives in an upscale neighborhood. He talks about how the night that Reagan was elected, the rich were firing off firecrackers and weapons and everything else. President Carter had been emphasized human rights as part of his foreign policy. And the people in El Salvador saw correctly that, that you know, none of this wishy-washy human rights stuff. You know, now we're going to get serious about defeating the communists. 
and it's not surprising that it was within three or four weeks after Reagan was elected. You first had the killing of the leftist political leaders, and then of the American nuns. I mean, they were they, and the opposition. I mean, the the the, the American the those particular nuns. Two of them were having dinner with the American ambassador a couple of nights before they were killed. The conversation was, "What's going to happen now?" They were very worried, very worried. You know, I, so it was. You know, I, but to say that, then you know, by the time Bush got elected, they realized this is you know, what are we doing in El? What are we doing in Central America? And Baker, you know, so I said Baker said, you know, we got to get out of there, and he went to the. It was, it's just hard to believe that we, we got so wrapped up in this area that is so tiny that it became, I mean, I remember a friend of mine, is years ago, saying, I don't know what it was I said, um, something about, and she said, how many people are there in Nicaragua? She really didn't know. You know, she was just, everything I was going on, I said, oh, three men. What? You know, what are we doing down there? Well, a lot of this involvement in any of these countries in Latin America always have their business people who are looking for opportunity, uh, the economic elites who who have relationships to the uh, elites or the oligarchs in those countries. So as what were you finding in your reporting uh, that stood out to you? I don't think it was. I don't think it was driven as much by economics um, as, say, it is in the Middle East. Has been driven by oil and economics. Mean, some, but it was mostly this. You know, it goes back. It, it's really, it's really the anti-communism. Um, I mean, Chile, Argentina. You know, you had the dirty war there. It was all in the name of of fighting communism. Yeah, there were some economic interests, but it was. It was more a visceral anti-communism, uh, and we and it goes back to the Monroe Doctrine. Really, this is our backyard, and we're not going to allow anybody to gain a foothold. What about the uh, part of your book you spend uh, going over the the coup that happens in the country? in 1984, is that correct? Or Sorry, it's not 1984, it's 19... No, 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 there were so many it's coups. 19, it's, uh, so this is the one that happened in, is it? Is this October? Yeah, but happens. you know, there were coups, and the Americans would think, oh, well, we've now got a military, we've got a coup, but, they, you know, we've got a supposedly a moderate military, or, but the, the, the moderates never had a chance in El Salvador. The right wing the, the, and the military, and they were the ones we were always supporting. And particularly after when, when, when Robert White was there in the Carter administration, they thought there was a chance to talk to some of these people. And then once the Reagan administration came in, there was no, no interest in talking to the people. They, they could say they were looking for a political solution, but in fact they looked for a military solution. Okay, yeah, so... And and that comes through in your in your document, your documenting of the history, even going back decades before the 1980s. That on a regular basis you have coups happening in this country. Uh, it was clearly not a, a stable country, um, and and so one of the big goals is to have an election. Isn't that correct? That like there's this huge uh, priority to have some kinds of elections, and they're they're deploying CIA, they're deploying Defense Department people. Uh, it's described that for people who probably you know don't know the scale of involvement of the U.S. in trying to get elections. Well, I mean, elections do not democracy make. I mean, you you can have elections, but unless you have the institutions, and the and, and nor is what happens on the voting day that critical. I mean, it's critical, but, you know, we make a big thing, oh, the lines were long and this and that, and you know, it was all, but that doesn't make a democracy. You have to have the institutions. You still had, even after you had the election, you basically had the Salvadoran military in control. 
even after an election. So, you know, I mean, we've seen it elsewhere. You can have, we've had elections in Iraq, but, you know, do we really have a democracy in Iraq? I don't think so. We've had elections in Iran. I mean, you can have elections, but just, we shouldn't think that, I mean, elections are important and we should have them, but don't, 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 don't think just because you've had an election, you now have a democracy. Uh, but uh, something important to just note is that while these elections are happening, uh, there is this threat out there that if people don't participate in the election, they're going to be killed. That's right. But I mean, I do think I do think there is a a yearning for elections and for democracy and a chance to vote. I mean, where was it? I someplace recently. Where I mean, I I, I really think that, but. But just because people vote doesn't mean they, you know, they, they've got a democracy. You've still got, you know, you've still got in El Salvador and a lot of places, you've still got uh, the military, which is really in control. I mean, they voted in Iraq. I mean, there are long lines to vote. And people do have a, a yearning for democracy. They voted in Kenya, long, I mean, where I was. I mean, you see it. But the only thing I caution against, I say before, don't, don't we should try to have elections, but don't think that automatically means you're going to have a democracy. Yeah, that, well, that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, and so uh, I think one of the documents you uncovered was uh, was a line where it showed that the uh, Reagan administration was well aware of the fact that one of the key issues in everything that they were doing is that they couldn't get the military to submit to civilian government, uh, and you and you say this is a really huge thing that this was obviously kept from everybody in the United States as the war was going on in El Salvador. Look, the bottom line is, and I repeat, we would not just as today we would probably not have gone into Iraq if the American people had known everything. If, if, if the, had, the government in Washington had been honest with the American people. And similarly, we clearly could not have sustained the policy in El Salvador. Again, it's hard to believe it, but that was as important as Iraq is today. We could not have sustained that policy if these cables, if this information had been made public. I mean, the reason they don't, they, they may keep these cables private is, is classified because is they don't want the American people to know. They don't want Congress to know. And Congress wasn't even informed. And if this had been known, look, I found a cable about torture. Um, about a torture, which by the way, sounds a lot like waterboarding where they put bags over these people's head and lime and, I mean, it sounded like waterboarding in El Salvador. That cable was classified. Now why do you think that was classified? T tell me. What, what? I'll tell you why, because the Ameri they didn't want the American people or the Congress to know what the Salvadoran government, which the United States was supporting, was up to. That's why this stuff is classified. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's the, if Bob White's cable, which I cite in the book now, and everybody ought to read, if Bob White's cable has been made, had been made public when he wrote it in early 1980, I guarantee you the debate about El Salvador would have been much more intelligent and much more helpful to carrying, to what American policy should be. That cable was so highly classified, something like 15 copies were made. If that cable had been made public at that time, we would have had a much more intelligent debate about the policy. Uh, so I've got a, a question from our uh, viewers that are watching us do this interview, and I uh, would like to ask, while you were there in country, what were you finding about how the El Salvadoran people, or the Salvadoran people, what were you finding how they viewed uh, the U.S.? Were, were they aware of the huge role the U.S. was playing and what was happening in their country, and what kind of attitude did they have? Yes, I think they were aware. I mean, certainly uh, the military and the oligarchy, the upper class, the educated were very definitely aware. Uh, 
which was clear. I mean, when, when Carter was defeated, I mean, when Reagan came in, I mean, wow, they knew very well. And I think, obviously, people out in the remote areas, the rural areas, the peasants had a limited, and probably in some ways, uh, you know, it was what was told to them by, by, um, by the political and the guerrilla leaders. But yeah, I think most, for the most part, they were aware, surprisingly. And were you seeing this having some kind of, uh, I guess, residual effect that, like, this was going to breed animosity towards Americans? Or was the, uh, I, I guess my other view could be maybe the, you know, these right-wing militias that they were dealing with were so terrifying that U.S. was just nothing compared to the terror they were dealing with from people within their own country. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I don't, I mean, the, 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 in spite of what many people in America think, the love for the United States is pretty big. Most people really admire the United States and look up to it. I mean, you know, everybody always says Cuba, all these people trying to flee Cuba, it shows you how, back, you know, in the 80s, it shows you how terrible it is. Let me tell you something. If you were opened up the borders to the United States, I used to say then, it may not apply today, to Denmark at that time, you know, there'd be long lines to get in. People do admire the United States. It's still, in spite of everything we do sometimes, it's still very much looked up to in this country. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. It's not about El Salvador, but on that issue. I was in Dara, in the tribal areas of, of uh, Pakistan. It's one of the gun capitals of the world, and uh, make guns. And this was back in the late 80s, 90s. And these kids were going on and on and on and screaming to me about America and America hates Muslims and America's this and America's that. On and on. And then this kid says to me, you know, this is somewhat of a dangerous place. He says to me, he says, can you get me a visa? And I said, wait a minute, you've just been telling me on and on and on how bad America is. And you want to go to America. Yeah, can you get me a visa? I said, I thought America was terrible. I know, but I want to, well, why do you want to go there? Because I want to make money, you know. I mean, don't underestimate the, the respect that America has in the world. I mean, I think we do our best to throw it away sometimes, sadly, but for the most part, and I think that's true in El Salvador. If you had told anybody in El Salvador they can come to America tomorrow, the place would be empty. Well, in fact, uh, we know that there have been flows of people fleeing El Salvador in uh, the last uh, five to ten years. So... The violence, uh, the, you know, the gang violence. Yeah, and uh, do you see that as as you as you hear about that? Do you see that as a residual effect of what happened in the eighties? I mean, are they still are is history then still reverberating and uh, putting them in a place? I mean, in the same way that like we can expect Iraqis to still be dealing with our war twenty years from now. Yes, I mean, I I, I must say I didn't feel that. And the other day I had an email exchange with a diplomat who had been in El Salvador at the time. And I was surprised. He said, he, 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 this was at a diplomat at the time, he finds a very, very direct correlation between the problems El Salvador is having today. We didn't use the time to build up any institutions, an independent judiciary, a justice system, or anything like that. And so any institutions... That did exist or could have existed, you know, were destroyed. So yes, there, there, there is, there is some. I mean, I wouldn't overly draw it. I mean, there's a lot of violence and a lot of gang violence, but uh, you know, we certainly the situation in the '80s contributed to the instability and the lack of institutions. Well, I have a couple more questions for you before we wrap. Sure. Uh, and this one has to do with, uh, you know, a country, you know, how we were using other countries in and around El Salvador to prosecute the war. I understand that at that time period, uh, we really began to transform Honduras into a place where we could use it as our base. Uh, we continue to have it as a, as a kind of U.S. military base of operations today. And I just was wondering... If what you saw happening then uh, carries any significance for you now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at Honduras. We had a coup. 
recently, you know, a few years ago, the United States didn't say anything. I mean, these, these places are, you know, El Salvador, uh, Honduras, I mean, Nicaragua, Guatemala, well, Guatemala is maybe finally coming out of it, but, uh, and then we walk away. That's the other thing, Kevin. We walk away. We go in there, and then we just walk away. I mean, this was, you know, we created the war, well, we didn't create them, we supported the wars there, we contributed to the instability, we used Honduras as a base to attack the Sandinistas, and then we just walk away. What have, we, what have we done for El Salvador and Honduras in the last 20 years? What have we done? Are we pouring money in? We poured money. Do you, do you realize during, I keep coming back to the point how significant it was. Do you realize during the 80s, El Salvador, this tiny country, was the third largest American embassy in the world after Cairo and New Delhi? And the, like the second or third or fourth largest recipient of American aid? And what have we done since? It's not a good record. Okay, so uh, I'll make my last question just... Uh... I mean, when you look back on what you were doing, I think that there's something very significant about your reporting. I, I definitely don't want to, you know, have necessarily... I don't want to run the risk of making you upstage the content and the seriousness of what's going on with the dirty war and all of the torture and carnage that was happening. But I do have to say that it seems like we do have this problem currently where there are fewer and fewer reporters who do deploy to these areas to cover um, what's happening and provide um, critical reporting. And I, I just wondered if you had any comment on, uh, on the journalism that you did back then and uh, if you are, have any concerns about today and it continuing in other countries. There's a lot of answers to that. Um... On one level, it was it's far more dangerous today than it was when I did it. I mean, journalists were not targeted. I had friends that were killed, caught in the crossfires or in the wrong place, but journalists weren't targeted like they are today. I could go in with the guerrillas of El Salvador and then go back into the country through the airport. I mean, it was risky, but and I used to go jogging every day, even though supposedly I was on a the government's death list. So it's much more dangerous, but you still have very, very good reporting. I mean, I think, and I'm no longer with the New York Times, so it's no institutional loyalty, but I think the New York Times does an excellent job. You've got Vice, which does incredible reporting. Um, you know, you've still got very, very, you know, British papers, uh, Channel 4, I mean, it, it, ITN. I mean, there's some very, very good reporting. There'll never be enough. Um, we used to say in in um, Central America, if El Salvador was the undercovered war, Guatemala was the uncovered war. I mean, just the other day, now you've seen, I don't know if you've noticed, the stories out of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is this little enclave between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and fight, fighting over. And I was there in 1997, 98, something like that. Yeah, and, I, and it was as bad as Sarajevo, but who, who's paying attention? So I'm, I'm not as, uh, I still think there's some very, very good reporting. There's some bad reporting. There's some terrible reporting. I think the general, the reporting post 9-11 has been not very good by journalism, but that's a whole other story you don't want to get me started on. Um, but I, 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 still, I still think journalists are doing a pretty good job. We can always do better, and we always should, but I'm, I think we're doing pretty good. And again, uh, just to put a button on this, to say that there are these distinct parallels that you think the questions that people have and, and the, the, the concerns they have about El Salvador, the questions they would ask about that war in, in looking at it are, are similar questions we should be looking at when we're talking about you know Iraq, Libya, these kind of wars that are, are really bogging us down and, and, and have catastrophe all over it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, 
what is our national interest? I mean, did we really have a national interest in Central America? Was it necessary to do what we did there? Um, to go in and it's it's similar today I mean I and I don't know the answer I don't know where I come out but what do we do about ISIS is ISIS a security threat to the United States and maybe that's not the only question maybe the humanitarian question is one you have to answer maybe there is a case for a humanitarian intervention but I think we have and I guess again and again I just think we have to have to be honest with the American people. I mean, that may sound like a you know corny statement, but again, when I rewrote this book, when I looked at it again, Kevin, the thing that stunned me the most was the, I had written the book, what, 1984. And when I went back to it and reread it, and I'm not promoting it or myself or anything else, I was stunned at the level of deceit that had gone on then. And I can only compare it to, you know, what's going on now with, do we really know what's going on in Libya? Do we really know what's going on with ISIS? Do, I, 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 you know, I just don't know. Do we know what's going on in Afghanistan? I don't know. And then uh, I do have one more thing. I, I just, keep right. going, just keep going. Just keep going. It's just, it's so dense, uh, uh, but it's really, okay. it, it's, there's just so much to grapple with and it has to be grappled with. Uh, but I do think that another uh, thing that I, I, I don't want to leave out here is that you can see a very big similarity with this era and, and now because there just is such impunity for anyone involved in this war that's carrying out these atrocities that they just, it seems like it's the continuing issue of humanity that we haven't figured out how to hold people accountable when they're involved in atrocities. Uh, I mean, we you can look at Nuremberg trials and say that we were able to get those people, and Slobodan Milosevic was put on trial in a tribunal, but uh, especially in the U.S. government and then also around the world, there's still this huge issue of holding people accountable, and that was a critical thing in El Salvador. Yeah, no, I mean, in El Salvador, we didn't even begin to have anything like an international criminal court or the court. I mean, I, I was in Bosnia. I mean, I covered a little bit of Karadzic and Milosevic. I happen to be, maybe I'm naive, but I'm a, and maybe I'm a lawyer, but I believe in the rule of law, and I think holding these people accountable through the, you know, through the courts is, is really terrific, and I, I think we ought to do more of it, and I think it's going to take a long time, but I it's something I very, very much support. I mean, there are two, and you know, there's a trial going on right now in Spain. Um, I mean, there are groups hunting down the people that perpetrated the human rights abuses in El Salvador. The committee for, I mean, the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco is doing incredible work. And there's now a trial in Spain of uh, one of the, you know, there was, we haven't talked about it because it was at the end of the Civil War, but when the military went in and killed those Jesuit uh, leaders in 1989 and it was horrific by the way I would note that there are people who have said and including there are cables that that might not have happened if the United States and Dalby San was behind that if the United States had been a little tougher eight, six eight ten years earlier we might not have had to but right now there is a trial in Spain and so there are there are movements to hold thank thankfully most to the Center for Justice and Accountability and in El Salvador, you had the Colonel uh, General Garcia and General Vitas Casanova, who came to the United States. They were allowed into the United States. These people who had presided over massacres and mass killings and human rights abuses, and they got into the United States. But now they've been deported. So there, there are there are movements, and I, I'm, I believe, perhaps naively, that this is a a very good way to go. I've lost you. I've lost. Uh, you. All right, Ray. I want to. I want to thank you for joining this discussion. Well, uh, so, thank you. Uh, and uh, it's it's really remarkable work. And mm. everyone who watches who who watched this interview who 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 will watch this interview, I want to make sure that you pick up the book. I'll even flash it on screen so people <laughs> know what it looks like when they are 
I imagine this is going to this this is in bookstores. I imagine you can go. I don't know if you yeah, you may just have to get it through or our books. I don't know if it's actually in physical books. All right, or, or or the the Amazon the right. the uh, the or books is the best place. But but direct you can go to right. or books oh, right. and uh, and get the and get this book um, right. and it is it is very very comprehensive and um, it and it contains all of your important reporting that you did back in the 1980s so again Ray thank you for joining us oh, thank you it was very very interesting thanks mate